Thank you for hanging around until the bitter end. I'd like to now bring the conference back to the blue beam of the leaf. So I'm going to talk about uh, issues regarding Eisenstein co-cycles on, uh, on linear groups. And what these things are, they're algebraic gadgets whose purpose is to package together all sorts of information about special values of zeta functions. And then being an algebraic gadget, they're very useful for people who want to study things like Iwasawa theory and piadic L functions. And this is sort of the angle that I'm coming at it from. So I'll talk about some of the following things in the, uh, in the next little while. I'll first speak mainly uh, historically and for motivational purposes about the much better known situation of GL2 and one co-cycles in this situation. Uh, Eisenstein series come into the picture in uh, the GL2 world in two different ways. In, in one sense, zeta values are Fourier coefficients of Eisenstein series, the constant coefficients. On the other hand, zeta values of real quadratic fields arise as periods of Eisenstein series. Uh, the interplay between these two appearances of, uh, of zeta values in the theory of Eisenstein series is quite, uh, is quite rich and contributes to the richness of the GL2 situation. Uh, well, well the, uh, the new stuff that I'll discuss in this talk are generalizations to n bigger than or equal to 2. These are not the first generalizations that have been proposed. There was uh, one given by Czech in around 1990 or so which, uh, which I'll mention briefly, but I'll focus mainly on, uh, on our construction, which, uh, which uses Shintani's method based on simplicial decomposition of uh, fundamental domains for units in number fields acting on the positive orthant. Uh, and if, uh, if I still see people's eyes open, I might make a few comments about the attic L functions. And, uh, and finally, I may mention one or two things about our, one of our main motivations, actually, in, uh, in pursuing the actual construction that we do. We wanted to get a comparison between the Czech point of view and, point of, and, the, uh, and the Shintani point of view. But let me start uh, very classically with, uh, with Eisenstein series. It's convenient for me to work with, uh, with some vector-valued Eisenstein series. So I'll let V be Q mod Z squared, and let me write script G for the space of functions from Q mod Z squared into the complex numbers. And uh, let me define a G-valued modular form, F, to be a function on the upper half playing with values in G such that, uh, well, before I define a vector value modular form, let me define a slash operator. Right? So if I have a G-valued function on the upper half plane, let me define F slashed with, uh, there should be a gamma in here, sorry about that, in weight K to be the uh, function at value at Z is the determinant of that matrix to the K minus 1 times the usual automorphic factor to the minus K, and then let gamma act on both variables of this function. And if gamma is a if big gamma now is a subset of GL2 plus of R, then I'll define the space of modular forms of weight k with values in g to be the space of g-valued functions of the upper half plane that are invariant under this slash operator with some extra holomorphic conditions at the cusps. And uh, I'm interested in very particular uh, uh, modular forms of this type. For uh, positive integer k, let me define e sub k to be the, fu the, the function on the upper half plane whose value at z is the function on script v, whose value at a vector little v is this uh, sum, which if you ignore the top bit, just looks like the standard weight k Eisenstein, weight, uh, weight k Eisenstein series, but I'm adding on this, uh, this character on top, defined by the exponential function, and I'll let e of z denote uh, e to the 2 pi i z as is fairly standard. And these Eisenstein series, as I was mentioning, are connected with zeta values. So, which zeta values? I'm going to work mainly with, uh, when I have to make a choice in this field, you can either work with Hecke L values or values of partial zeta functions. I'm going to do the latter. Uh, so let me define for a positive integer n, which serves as a modulus, and uh, B, which serves as a residue class modulo n, let me define the partial zeta function associated to these data to be the sum of n to the minus s, where n varies over 
uh, integers congruent to b modulo n, so it's a, has flavor of a Horvitz zeta function, which some of you might be familiar with. And in fact, using the uh, classical techniques for Horvitz zeta functions, you can show that this partial zeta function has analytic continuation to c minus zero, simple pole, uh, that should say c minus one, I'm sorry, the simple pole at s equals one with, uh, with residue one over n. And this shares other properties with the standard Riemann zeta function in that the, its values at negative integers are explicit rational numbers. The, for the Riemann zeta function, you get Bernoulli numbers. For these partial zeta functions, you get values of Bernoulli polynomials at rational arguments. Uh, the, uh, these involve yeah, so these involve b and n in, in the way I explain, and the constant coefficients of the Eisenstein series I defined on the previous slide are these uh, are these partial zeta values. Okay, so I'm, let me I write down the Fourier expansion explicitly here. And these sigmas in the non-constant coefficients are some funny-looking divisor sums. The uh, the point is though that this up to, except for this factor of two by i to the k out in front, these coefficients are all rational numbers, right? So this power series in q sub n, which is just e of z over n, is uh, rational up to this power of two pi i. Right. So uh, partial zeta values are Fourier coefficients of Eisenstein series. On the other hand, Eisenstein series come up in another way. Also, they or partial zeta functions of Eisenstein series are related in another way in that they're, that partial zeta values are periods of Eisenstein series for real quadratic fields f. So let me let f be a real quadratic field, let me let n be, uh, and b be ideals of f. So if n I'm gonna view as a narrow, as a modulus, and b as a narrow ray class modulo n. And let me assume that, okay, so how many typos is that so far? That b is relatively prime to n, and I'll define the partial zeta function now associated to this data to be the analog of the corresponding object for a q that I've described before, sum the norms of the ideal, of the integral ideals of f that are relatively prime to my modulus n and whose Frobenius are the Frobenius at b of this fixed ideal class. And uh, it was Siegel who gave a relationship between these partial zeta values for, re for real quadratic fields and periods of the vector-valued Eisenstein series that I defined a few slides ago. The uh, relationship looks like this. Zeta nb of one minus k is equal to, well, something divided out by two pi i to the k, this essential transcendental quantity, times an integral uh, over some path in the upper half plane of some object times the Eisenstein series. And let me define these objects. So here's the formula again up top. And now I give you a notational dump. So the f is my real quadratic field. And I'm going to write the two embeddings of f into the real numbers with, just with subscripts. So the first embedding will be subscripted 1, the second subscripted 2. Let me let epsilon be a fundamental totally positive unit congruent to 1 modulo n. And let me consider the fractional ideal b inverse n. So this is a rank two Z module, and let me choose a basis for that, Let's call it W1 and W2, and let me make sure this basis is positively oriented in the sense that the determinant of the, these basis vectors is positive. Let me let P of XY be the norm form of this uh, fractional ideal in the given in the basis W1, W2, so this is a quadratic polynomial with integer coefficients. And let me let V be uh, scalars such that v1 times w1 plus v2 times w2 equals 1. And finally, let, me let rho sub w be the regular representation of f acting on itself by multiplication. Right, so in other words, f is the matrix. Uh, f rho sub w of x is, the is just the conjugate of the diagonal matrix x1, x2 by my basis matrix. Anyway, so what I'm doing is I'm integrating over a path from tau, some complex number in the upper half plane, to the fundamental unit times it, times this polynomial, quadratic to the power 
2k minus 1, so this is a polynomial of degree 2k minus 2 times an isomorphic series of weight 2k. So these are the, these are the usual numerology for such periods. Now, what, uh, what one can actually do, and this is illuminating and, and useful for various algebraic purposes, is to recast Siegel's theorem homologically. So let me, as a shorthand, write script P for the space of, home, of polynomials in X and Y, and let me write script F for the space of functions from V times P into C, where V is Q squared mod Z squared, still. And given this data, I can define a co-cycle, a one co-cycle, with values in F, exactly as in Siegel's formula. It's an elementary calculation that this phi sub tau actually does give me a one co-cycle on SL2 of Z with values in F, and its cohomology class is independent of this base point tau that I began with. In fact, one can do a little better. One can give a rational version of this co-cycle. One can actually find a co-cycle, first of all, that extends to GL2 of Q and takes values in the space of Q-valued functions on v mod on v times uh, on v times b. This is a result of uh, of Glenn Stevens. Uh, I'm not going to uh, yeah. Sorry, just on that last slide with the co-cycle definition, where is the where's the totally real field now? Uh, it's not there yet. In fact, this co-cycle encodes the values at negative integers for all partial zeta values of all real quadratic fields for all moduli, all uh, all narrow ray classes and all the negative integers at the same time, which is sort of remarkable, which is, I think, one of the reasons that this is such an interesting object. Yeah, so, so far I've defined a co-cycle without mentioning any real quadratic field. Just mentioned, just with an Eisenstein series. And now if you want to bring the quadratic fields back into the picture, let me let all the notation be as it previously was. And what I can do is I can pair this one co-cycle with a one cycle under the cap product. And the cycle is constructed by mashing together all of these invariants that are specific to the quadratic field, the modulus, the ideal class, the ray class, this chosen basis, <coughs> fundamental unit, uh, V and P as defined earlier. And if you, uh, if you work through the details, what you get is a one cycle with values in V times P whose cohomology class is independent of the basis of uh, B inverse N that I chose. Now the cap product, which is a fancy way of saying evaluation map, gives me a way of pairing cohomology classes with values in functions on V times P, that's the F, with homology classes with values in uh, v times p, and written in this way using the cap product, the partial zeta value associated to n and b at 1 minus k is just the cap product of this cohomology, of the Eisenstein Siegel cohomology class with this cycle associated to my data coming from the real quadratic field. All right, so the remarkable thing is this single cohomology class phi encodes partial zeta values for all real quadratic fields, all conductors, all narrow ray classes, and all uh, non-positive non integers, one minus k, sort of all at the same time. And just the existence of this thing is sort of remarkable, but uh, it's also useful for various purposes. And for this reason, one naturally wants to see if such things exist in more generality, can we move beyond the world of real quadratic fields? Uh, in particular, can we construct such cohomology classes that encode partial zeta values of totally real fields at non-positive integers? And this is a natural thing to want to do because of the so-called Kling and Siegel theorem that if you look at the partial zeta values associated to real or totally real fields at non-positive integers, these are in fact rational. Right? So this was originally proved by Siegel in the case of real quadratic fields using Siegel's formula, the ideas I've mentioned in the previous slides. It was proven for arbitrary totally real fields by Klingen and Siegel using a, a different method, also involving Eisenstein series though, and then 
In the 70s, Shintani gave a totally different proof of this rationality result using Shintani's method, as it's now known, which involves uh, simplicial decompositions of uh, group actions of units, which I'll say more about a little later. So as I was saying, the Kling and Siegel proof uses the fact that const, or maybe I didn't say it, the Kling and Siegel proof uses Hilbert modular Eisenstein series and the fact that their Q expansions still have partial zeta values as constant terms and corresponding rationality results for these Hilbert modular Eisenstein series and Shintani's method is completely different. One can ask if there's a cohomological version of these rationality formulas. Is there a, an Eisenstein co-cycle floating around that packages together all these rational numbers in, in a similar way to in the case of real quadratic fields? Now, you can give a partial answer using the ideas of Klingen and Siegel using Hilbert modular Eisenstein series, but this is not as universal as the co-cycle in the case of real quadratic fields. What this gives you is a cohomology class, first of all, for GL2 of the totally real field, but it encodes partial zeta values for totally real F, which are quadratic extensions of a fixed totally real subfield, F0. So the uh, GL2 case is the case where F0 is Q, right, so which is why it didn't really come up, because Q is unique. What if you want to, can, you, can we do better though? Can we avoid making this choice of totally real quadratic subfield F0 on which everything depends? And in fact you can, but both constructions avoid, or be, avoid Eisenstein series entirely, which might not be entirely unexpected because the theory of Eisenstein series for GLN for N bigger than, for N bigger than or equal to three is, is a lot different than the GL2 theory because you don't have nice modular varieties anymore. The associated symmetric spaces are only real analytic manifolds. So a lot of the algebraic geometry that we're implicitly using to prove rationality results uh, involving Eisenstein series just don't carry over in a naive way, uh, at least not in a way that I understand, to Eisenstein series for GLN. So we're just going to throw out Eisenstein series. But the terminology, Eisenstein will persist. Let me make a few remarks about the first construction of such a generalization, which was given by Czech in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. And I'm only gonna say, I'm gonna say very little about it, but I just think it's so amazing that I have to mention it. It just seems sort of bizarre. If you, uh, what you do is you wanna define an N cycle, an N minus one homogeneous co-cycle on GLN of Q as follows. Well, an n minus one homogeneous n minus one cycle takes as input n matrices in GLN of Q, and if I choose n of n such matrices, let me let sigma i of x for a for a vector x be the minimal column in the i matrix which is not orthogonal to x, and let me let sigma be the matrix that I get by putting these all into columns. Let me exit. Let me then introduce a strange kind of set, the set script Q, the set of Y's in R to the N, whose entries, whose actual coordinates are Q linearly independent. And Scheck defines a co-cycle with, uh, with values in Q mod Z to the N now, times P times Q as follows. I'm actually only gonna define this for the, uh, for, linear, for constant polynomials. The value of his polynomial on this n-tuple of matrices is the function that sends a vector v and a vector q to this sum involving all this data that I uh, uh, defined previously. The thing that you, that's sort of interesting here is that this sum is not absolutely convergent. So this is some conditionally convergent sum, so it makes sense if you have to specify an order of summation. And he specifies it as follows. It's defined in terms of this auxiliary vector q. And what you do is you sum the x's over the, sorry, over the x's for which the inner product of that x with q is sufficiently small, and then let that notion of small tend to infinity. And then this thing converges and is actually something. 
which still sort of amazes me. Uh, so his theorem is that this Q summation process converges, defines an n minus 1 co-cycle with values in this new f, the space of functions on q mod z to the n times p times q with values in the rationals, and it encodes partial zeta values at negative integers for all totally real fields of degree n, all moduli, all narrow ray classes, etc. So this is really a, a universal Eisenstein co-cycle. It has application to piatic zeta functions in pro stark units. My collaborators worked out some of this stuff. But uh, it's extremely delicate in that it uses conditional convergence methods to, uh, to prove things. And it sort of bypasses the other proof of the rationality, which is Shintani's method, and appeals again to Siegel's, to the Klingon Siegel proof of, uh, of rationality of these zeta values. What we wanted to do is we wanted to give an alternative construction of this n cycle using Shintani's method to give a cohomological version of, these rationality, of his rationality argument. And the, uh, the essential input comes from, well, not surprisingly, from the combinatorics of cones. These things appear prominently in Shintani's proof. So for vectors, if, I give you, if you give me m vectors in R to the n, let me define c of those vectors to be the open simplicial cone that, uh, that they span. And let me write script k of l for the l span of the characteristic functions of such cones. So note that I'm not insisting that the number of vectors is equal to the dimension of my ambient space. I'm allowing degenerate cones in some sense. And L here is just any subfield of, uh, of the real numbers, say. And the basic observation is that you can write down something very easily that really is almost a co-cycle. If you take n matrices in GLN of R and some base vector sigma in R to the n, you can define phi of A to be, well, the sign of the determinant of a of all these a's acting on this base vector sigma times the characteristic function of the corresponding cone spanned by the a's times this fixed vector sigma. So this is some characteristic function, or this is some object that lies in the characteristic in the space. This is the characteristic function of a cone. It lies in k. This is not a co-cycle, although it's sort of close. If, uh, so let me, let's draw, let's analyze the co-cycle identity in the case where n equals 2. All right, so the differential of this phi evaluated on the now a triple of matrices is this alternating sum of characteristic functions of cones spanned by 2 out of the 3 weighted by these sine factors. And what you observe is that if you well, if the, vectors are, if the vectors W are arranged, say, in counterclockwise fashion, then this differential is negative the characteristic function of W2. Just from the, uh, from the overlap of these things. Now, we actually want, to, we want this to be zero, right? So there are a couple ways to arrange this. David Solomon proposed a fix in the n equals 2 case where you assign different weights to the various faces of the cones in order to ensure cancellation. And this works in the n equals 2 case, but becomes very difficult to carry out in higher dimensional cases because of the different possible relative orientations of all these vectors. If I do a very special picture here, you need to consider more cases in Solomon's analysis, depending on how the w's are arranged relative to each other. We, uh, we take a different approach to deal with these boundary faces and, uh, and this weighting problem, and it's based on a, a very simple method involving what we call Q perturbation. Incidentally, this Q that we perturb by ends up being related to Check's Q, that weird vector that appeared in his uh, defining his conditional convergence. So this is the, this is the connection between the Shintani and Check methods. So if we take a vector q and r to the n, which is not in the span of any proper subset of my uh, w's that I began with, what I'm going to define is the 
characteristic function of my cone spanned by the w's perturbed by q to be this limit as epsilon tends to zero through positive values of the characteristic function of my cone, but evaluate it now on x plus a little multiple of q. Right? And this is if these w's are all linearly independent and just forget about it otherwise. Now note that this one superscript q subscript c of the w is still in my k. It's a sum of characteristic functions of open simplicial cones, even if it's itself is not a single char such characteristic function, but it still lives in the same world. And uh, let me write just C sub Q of W for the Q perturbed cone. By this I mean just the support of the characteristic function that uh, I define through this Q perturbation process. And let's see uh, how this rescues the, or how this gives us the co-cycle identity. If you parse the limit definition from the previous slide, what you're doing is we're saying we're including a boundary face if when we perturb it by Q, that boundary face moves into the simplex. All right. So if I look at the three simplices uh, in the previous picture, if I perturb the simplex spanned by W1 and W2 by a positive multiple of the vector Q equals 0, 1, then the lower face moves into the simplex and the upper face moves out of the simplex. So the perturbed version of that includes the bottom face and doesn't include the top face. Right. You do the same thing for the other two simplices, and you note that, well, we never get the uh, top edge included, and the other edges, uh, the other edges are going to cancel. So in fact, with this cute perturbation, we get the co-cycle identity holding. Right. So one might think that maybe this Q perturbation took our naive almost co-cycle and turned it into an actual honest co-cycle. Not, life's not that simple. There's another more fundamental obstruction that you can't perturb away, and this involves uh, functions whose support contains a line. Let me let L be the subspace of my K. Uh, this, I want this to be the subset generated by functions whose support contains a line. But here's an example. Let me let Q again be the vector pointing upwards along the y-axis, and let me consider the cones spanned by W1, W2, and W3. Now if I, if I look at the uh, Q perturbed version of these cones, and I look at the support of the corresponding characteristic functions. Well, if I perturb the cone spanned by W2 and W3, both boundary rays move into the simplex, so they get included. If I look at the uh, simplex spanned by W1 and W2, then only the bottom ray moves into the simplex. So when you add these two things up, what you actually get is the characteristic function of the entire closed upper half plane. Right? And this, this is not going, you can't rescue this, you can't make this zero use some, using some sort of simple pertur perturbatory fix. So we do what we always do, but we say, oh, we don't care about those things anyway. So <laughs> we mod out by such functions. And what we get is, well, we can show that if Q is not in the, sp is not in the span of any proper subset of my basis vectors W, then I have a co-cycle identity holding up to this uh, set L, this group L generated by functions containing a line. Right? So in particular, if I, uh, if I again take my same set Q as in check, the set of all vectors in R to the N, which are Q linearly, whose entries are Q linearly independent, and I let F be the space of functions on this Q into now K mod L, and I choose a basis vector sigma, which I won't reflect in the notation, then, if, then assigning phi of AQ to be the sign of the determinant of the matrix of vectors AI times sigma times the Q perturbed characteristic function of this cone, what I get is that I get an honest co-cycle now 
on an honest n cocycle, n minus 1 cocycle, sorry, on GLN of Q with values in this f. All right, so this is some sort of exotic construction or some construction giving us an n cocycle, an n minus 1 cocycle in some very exotic module, some space of character some space spanned by characteristic functions of cones, modulo some subspace involving uh, cones containing lines. What's not clear here is well what's the connection between this and zeta values, which is really what I care about, and what's the, what's the connection between this Shintani based construction and checks construction involving conditional conversions. So I can say a few words about all of these issues, but I might not say anything. I, well, we'll see how, uh, how, how, we, how it goes. So the connection with partial zeta values goes through what are so-called cone generating functions and Shintani zeta functions, really through Shintani's machinery. And the connection with Sheck's co-cycle is a little bit trickier because at the moment they don't even take values in a common coefficient module. So we have to do some massaging before we can actually make any precise comparison there. So let me talk about cone generating functions, something that's really just combinatorial. If uh, again I take r vector, or if I take now r vectors in z to the n, which are linearly independent, to consider the <coughs> open simplicial cone that they span, let me define g of c v to be the generating series of the lattice points that lie in the translate by v of this cone c. Right? So just add up x1 to the m1 times x2 to the m2, et cetera, or just x to the multi-index m, where m varies over the lattice points contained in c minus v. And this gives me a formal power series in the variables x and x inverse. Uh, the use essential property here is that this is actually a rational function. Right? And the reason is that we can let P be the fundamental parallelogram of this cone C, and in which case the, uh, this power series can be expressed as well, a finite sum over lattice points in the translate by the, of the fundamental parallelogram divided by this product of uh, x mi uh, 1 minus x to uh, various powers, or x to the multi-indices defined by these basis vectors w, and this is just the geometric series formula uh, r times. So given a cone and, uh, and a vector, we can form this rational function, which serves as a generating function for the lattice points contained in that cone translate. Now, uh, Kovansky and Pukilov and Lawrence independently showed that this generating function doesn't depend necessarily on the cone. It only depends on its characteristic function, which is not, uh, which is not evident. And moreover, that if you take the uh, the generating series associated to a, a cone that contains a line, then the corresponding, well, if you take a cone that contains a line, then the corresponding generating series is actually zero. So what we get is an induced map on the space of characteristic functions generated, or space of functions generated by characteristic functions of cones, modulo the subset of functions generated by lines, times vectors in q to the n into this space of uh, rational functions in x1 through xn. And note that this space of rational functions, ex except in the case where n equals 1, this does not embed into this power series ring. Right? So these things aren't meromorphic at 0. You have a, they'll typically be uh, singular on a product of, on planes passing through the origin. This is actually the essential analytic difficulty which uh, Shintani overcame in his proof of the rationality of zeta values of real quadratic fields. Right. So let me uh, give another version of the cocycle construction in the previous slide, but instead of, but now I can make it power series valued, 
essentially by taking the previous construction and now applying this operator G to it. So let me define the cocycle phi, which on an n tuple of matrices spits out the function whose value on a pair Q of E is this simple exponential factor times this characteristic, uh, this generating series evaluated now at e, to, at e of z. So it's now an exponential generating series. And if you plug that into the expression from the previous slide, you get this rational expression in exponentials, which if you expand, actually gives you this generating series involving exponentials, which actually makes no sense. <laughs> right? It doesn't convert in any sort of way, but intuitively it's sort of what you want to think about. And it follows from the Kovansky-Pukilov theorem that this phi is now an n minus 1 co-cycle on GLNQ with values in this space of functions with values now in this uh, in Q double round brackets 2 pi i z, where this is not a space of the raw series, this is the fraction field of the power series ring in, uh, in, in z and z inverse. These are essentially different when you're in more than one variable, all right? These things aren't going to be meromorphic at, uh, at the origin. And the connection between uh, this, this the generating, or these co-cycles and Shintani's theorem is as follows. Let me recall some of the notation from earlier. Let's, let me express it in the real quadratic case. If I take a real quadratic field F, a modulus N, a ray class B, uh, fundamental unit epsilon for the units, uh, totally positive units can grow into one modulo n. And I define, I choose a basis as before, and I define a specific perturbation vector q just to be the vector 0, 1, but written in the, or the coordinates of the vector 0, 1 in this basis w. Then what I can do is I can restate. Shintani's theorem, his theorem on the rationality of zeta values at negative integers in the following cohomological way. The partial zeta value at a negative integer k is k factorial squared times the coefficient of the generating series associated to all this data. And I'm extracting the coefficient of z1 times z2 to the k in this quadratic situation. And here you should be concerned because coefficient doesn't really make any sense. As I was mentioning, the generating series aren't analytic in a punctured neighborhood of zero, all right? So there's no Laurent expansion. You can't actually take a coefficient. You need to interpret this properly. And in fact, there's a, one can do this, and this is an algebraic version of Shintani's trick for, uh, for analytically continuing his, uh, his zeta functions, which is a generalization of, uh, of the Hankel contour method for analytically continuing the Riemann zeta function. Okay, so it was quite clever. This is why it took 100 years for someone to generalize that, uh, that proof. Anyway, the key, again, this is not a replacement for Shintani's theorem. This is just a restatement of it. And the key point here in the real quadratic case is that the uh, cone spanned by 1 and the fundamental unit perturbed by this vector 0, 1 is a fundamental domain for the action of the unit group of my real quadratic field on the positive quadrant in, uh, in R2, where the units act on R2 through the embedding and then through component-wise multiplication. And the picture over here. So uh, here is the vector spanned by the uh, image in R2 of the fundamental unit, and this is the image of well, just 1. So this cone here tessellates the, uh, the positive quadrant here under the action of the unit group. And if you want to generalize this uh, evaluation to totally real fields n to get partial zeta values in that context, what you really need to do is construct such explicit fundamental domains. And this is more difficult because the combinatorics in this case are significantly more complicated. What we need to do is go from a basis of a unit group, so rank n minus 1 unit group for a totally real field of degree n, to some 
group ring element in z adjoin gl2 of q to the n. You can't just do it by listing out the basis vectors. It's not going to give you a cocycle. Here's how you do it. This is motivated by a construction of Holmes. If, uh, if f is, my to is a totally real field of degree n, and again, I write subscripts in, uh, to denote the real embeddings, let me define uh, an orientation or a sign to be the determinant of the logarithmic of the uh, the sign of the determinant of the logarithmic embedding matrix of these units, the uh, regulator sign of the regulator essentially, and for each permutation sigma of one through n minus one, let me define another unit vi sigma to be the product well of well you list out the units the base of the unit group in this permuted order and then multiply the first i of them. And uh, define an associated sign similarly to this sign involving the whole unit group. I'm now involving these v's, and I won't go into the combinatorics. But what you can show is that these v's give you a, an explicit fundamental domain for the action of this rank n minus one unit group now on the positive orthant in R to the n. This was proved independently by. Uh, by Diaz, E. Diaz, and Friedman, their, uh, their proof actually uses something called topological degree theory. The fact that it's called topological degree theory is the only thing I know about their proof. I don't know what that actually is. But uh, what we get is a, an explicit fundamental domain. There's a bit of a fudging here because there are signs involved. And so what this means explicitly is that if you look at the sum over elements of our unit group of the sum over permutations, of these signs, kind of these characteristic functions perturbed by Q, where uh, they multiply X by component-wise by the version of U embedded in R to the N, this all adds up to one, all right? You tessellate the entire positive orthant using this fundamental domain and the unit group. And essentially, for our purposes, these Vs, they give you essentially uh, one co-cycle. Like they're going to satisfy the, uh, a co cycle identity. Uh, in other words, if you take this n tuple of units, these v's that I just constructed, and mash them together with some data specific to my field, then what I can do is I can again take a cap product of the associated cycle with the Shintani co-cycle that I defined earlier, and I do again get zeta values. Right? So I can evaluate zeta functions at negative integers by, uh, by pairing, using the cap product, the Shintani co-cycle, and this cycle uh, constructed using this explicit fundamental domain uh, involving a basis of the unit group. For this, uh, for this totally real field, and leveraging the full power of Shintani's analysis, we can derive explicit formulas for these uh, zeta values, these pairings, in terms of Bernoulli numbers. Right. And uh, let me just read the title of this slide. You can, well, this was our original motivation for uh, doing this analysis. We wanted to use Shintani's method to construct p L functions for uh, totally real fields, and in fact you can do this, and this cohomological method gives you nice, a nice way of uh, proving the, the order of vanishing of these chaotic L functions about what one would expect it to be. So this uses the theorem of Spies on, uh, on vanishing of certain uh, logarithmic cohomology classes that are, sim that are associated to these uh, classes that I constructed previously. This uh, is a known result, actually, this follows from Wiles' main conjecture. So it's not a new result, but it's a much more elementary, uh, elementary proof of it. Anyway, it's a nice example of the homological method paying off. And the other payoff is that, uh, well, we can explicitly compare the Shintani co-cycle and the Czech co-cycle, but this involves two, two slides of complicated formulas. And I don't want to end off on two slides of complicated formulas. So let me, uh, let me stop there. Thank you.
convection uses simplicial, simplicial topological methods. So I really think there is a, one can make some implicit connection here. I would love to see a connection between Eisenstein series and all of these things, but this I, I have no idea how to do. So as far as I know, the Eisenstein symbol is Eisenstein in name only. Because it's, it's analogous to the, uh, to the classical one. Yeah. But, uh, okay. Connection between the Eisenstein series and the Eisenstein symbol. Yeah. 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 Series is fabulous, but there can't be that many, too many different constructions of the same thing. This is all, and there must be a way of uh, I mean, I think it would be nice to be able to do this, but I think that I'm not just going to do it. I agree. But I, I wish I knew how to do that. So you're, uh, this new construction of the p-adic uh, L functions. Is there any hope of uh, this construction shedding more light on stuff like trivial zeros or anything like that? Or is it just a new way of getting out sort of what we need? Uh, the, what's useful is you can use it to give sort of formula, local formulas for what one expects to be gross start units. To at least some candidates for these things in the uh, in setting of totally real fields, although proving is irrational with something uh, I don't really know, I have no idea how to do. Any more questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker.